Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> nice to have the visitors uh, here this morning, and uh, thankful to be able to uh, get to talk to you uh, afterwards um, and get to know you and, and stick around. And if you're looking for a church family, I hope you know you found it, um, and, and, and ask questions and um, get to uh, allow us to show us uh, this is a great family and a great church family, um, and we'd love for you to spend some more time with us. Uh, Derek, could you turn that down just a, a little bit? I know when I can hear my voice in the speaker that it's already too loud, um, so I appreciate that. We have been looking at the beginning of the year, we were looking at God and His existence. We were looking at Him as a great designer and the evidence of design in this world, uh, giving evidence that there is a great mover, that there must be a great cause uh, to the universe in which we live in. And so we were looking at here and came to Psalm 139, and we looked at the first passage there in Psalm 139, 1 through 6. And we looked at here that this is the omniscient God. And as we looked at this passage, we noted a few things. We noted that God sees. God sees everything. God sees, as David is writing this, uh, God is, uh, David is saying that God knows that when I rise and when I lie down, when I sit, he knows everything. And some of those words there talked about how God really has this kind of fanned out like a deck of cards and sees the inside and outside of us and knows us better than everything uh, and anything. And so God knows more than anything about us, knows more than our spouse, knows more than our best friend. He knows us inside and out. And despite all of these things, and, and, and in this, David is really saying this in a positive way. We might take this, and in, in this passage, really, in this next passage that we're looking at, we really could take it in two ways, positive or negative. But the way in which David is writing this, he's writing this in a positive manner. And so God sees, God knows everything about us, even the things that we'd rather him not know about us. And in the end, we find that God cares. God cares, and we see the extension of his hand. And a lot, a lot of times, the right hand of God is used of power, of authority, to take out the enemy. And here it is used in a way extending grace. So God sees, God knows, and God cares. And so we're gonna, we look at the omniscient God, and we find out that it's not just that God knows everything, but that he knows everything about me. He knows me. This great and powerful God, an existing God, knows me on a personal level that no one else knows in the world. So now as we move on to verse 7 through 12, this next passage here in Psalm 139, if you're not already turned there in your Bibles, that's where we're going to be spending our time. We're going to be moving on here to the omnipresent God. The omnipresent God. And I want us to look here. There's some interesting things that are going on here in verse 7. Ah, <clears throat> uh, the AC now is back on, and it's the turner of my pages. Like I've missed it, and I've not missed it. Verse 7 of 139, David says here, Where can I go from your spirit? And he got, it's kind of a rhetorical question here, and he answers it with another question. He says, Or where can I flee from your presence? What's interesting about this is the perspective is, is is David's writing this, and we may not know this looking at it in the first, uh, just looking at the word in your English uh, translations, but your presence there is in the plural. So if you like to take notes in your Bible, I would write, underline your presence, and I would write down plural. Now, does David really know about the triune God, or the Trinity as it's sometimes referred to? David certainly doesn't have a, a complete understanding of Jesus Christ. But he does have an understanding of your spirit. And so when David says, where can I flee from your spirit? The David has in mind, God is in his throne. God is in heaven. God is in his throne. But his spirit is extending out. And so David at least sees two of the triune God. Now, with us having the bigger picture and understanding Jesus Christ, being the son of God, coming out of heaven and taking on the flesh, human flesh, and becoming humanity. We see something even further here in this, word, this use of the plural word presence. It means, the word actually means 
faces or appearances. And what I think David might be also saying here, taking in the median context, is God is just everywhere. His face is everywhere. He, he is multiplied beyond anything that we can imagine. And he is everywhere. Where can I go from your many faces or your appearances? And ultimately, David's going to come to the conclusion that there's really nowhere I can go. And is that, from your perspective, if you're thinking here this morning, is that a positive or negative thing? Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? I hope all of us are saying that's a good thing. Because there is, there is part of it. But the focus that David is it's a positive thing. And so he says here, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? And again, the, as I said, these questions are rhetorical. There is no place. But he's going to expound upon this idea and put in some extremes here for us to understand. And I hope that we can see some practical application in our life as well. And so he says, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make, make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. And so here, David is giving the extremes of what he knows is extreme is heaven and Sheol. Death. That which is in heaven, that which is in space, and that which is here in the grave. Now, this is not the word normally used in the Old Testament to signify hell. But what I think that David might be talking about here is in a couple of places, either the afterlife or just being buried six feet in the ground. But in either place in the afterlife or whether I try to ascend into the atmosphere, as far as I could possibly go, God, if I try to go as far as I can into space, God is present. If I go as far as I can into the earth, God is present. And so we have extremes here that David is the examples to answer those questions. Where can I flee from your spirit? Where can I go from your presence? The thing that he looks at, <clears throat> that he talks about here in verse, uh, in verse 9, he says, If I take the wings of dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea. You know, I don't like to get up early. I have gotten up early enough to see the dawn of the sun. But I imagine there might be people in here that just don't want to get up that early, that haven't seen the sun actually rise. If you have it, you're missing out on something spectacular and beautiful. But it's also what David is speaking to here. What's cool about the sun uh, rises here is it rises and there's some mountains out here behind some hills. And it comes up just, and you, can, you know that it's coming, right? You know because you can see the brightness behind the hills. But the light hasn't hit you yet. But once it barely gets up above the hill, boom, it's right in your eyes. Instantly. Instantly. And I know that, you know, we've, we've science classes in here, and we understand that the speed of light is incredible. The speed of life is incredibly fast. But we don't think about that in that instance. When the sun comes up and it just pokes over the hill and it's instantly in our eyes, we're not really thinking about the speed of light, but we just witnessed the speed of light. And so when David is saying, now David doesn't have the calculations for the speed of light. But what he is saying here, when he talks about here, he says, if I take the wings of the dawn, if I, even if I take the speed of which the sun comes out and peaks up and rises up, I cannot match the speed of God. I cannot outrun God. Now, for some, some may want to do that very thing and outrun God and not be in his presence. But there's no speed. There is no ability to have in of ourselves to outrun God, no matter how hard we try. And for some, that is a great thing. I don't want to outrun God. I don't ever want to not be in his presence. But there may be some that don't want to be in his presence at all, that are fearful of his presence. 
are fearful of what he might see and what he might know. Remember, we talked about this. A few weeks ago. David says he knows everything about me. He's me out before me, and yet he extends it. God that is in our presence. The God that wants the hand of grace, not the right hand to smash and destroy us, but the hand that extends grace. And we can't outrun him. David is, David is using extremes to help us to understand. He says, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, the distance of the sea, in the remotest part where no one else may be, in the most lonely place that you could ever imagine, and be by yourself, surrounded by no one. Because sometimes, you know, we think, if you're like me, you need downtime from people. Anybody in here need downtime from people? You need you know, I, I know, I actually, I, I could point to people in here that I know that need downtime from people, right? <clears throat> and we want to be alone. We might even want to be in the remotest part of the sea to just distance ourselves from noise, from people that surround us, the people that overwhelm us, the people sometimes are just draining, even though they don't mean to be draining. Sometimes there are people that mean to be draining. But do you ever, oh, I'm so glad to be alone and then realize you're not. Now, again, that could be something that it's an amazing thing for us to consider. That even we go and we are alone and we're in a place of solitary, that God is with us there. How do we respond to that? It's been interesting after I've been studying this, this lesson. And, and that most of us have the concept or understanding that God is with us. But how much do we actually dwell on that and think about that on a daily, on a daily basis? But it's made me think about it much more. That as I was going to greet my wife in the morning. She was up earlier than me. Yeah, she maybe saw the sunrise and I didn't that day. But I had my mind, God's with me as I go and, and speak to my wife. How am I going to greet my wife? How am I going to speak to her this morning? As I was driving to go and meet someone to have a Bible study, I had the conscious thought to think, God's with me as I'm going here. God's with me when I'm going to sit down and have this study with this person in front of me. God's going to be there with me as I speak his words and share his words. He's going to be in my mind and heart as I'm delivering this message to this person who desires to know more about God. He's with me. The next thing that I want us to see here is even there, even when we are in heaven, even if we are in shield, even if we are able to take the wings of dawn, even if we are the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me. What a great uh, song we just uh, sang there. He leadeth me. He leadeth me. And again, just like in the passage 1 through 6, the idea of his hand is used to extend grace, to extend comfort. I remember years ago we went to New York. And we were walking down Broadway. If you've ever walked down Broadway, you know that that's a pretty interesting place. There's a lot of interesting people uh, that you don't really probably see as you're walking downtown Parker, right? And we were, Rylan was about nine years old. It's all right, Rylan, you're not going to be embarrassed, but this is what happens when you're a preacher's kid. You get talked about. There's a few preachers kid around here I can see that, that know, uh, know about this as well. But it's right around that age, 9 or 10, you know, where you don't hold dad's hand as much. Right? You know, toddler, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, you know, you're holding dad's hand. 9 or 10, you're kind of, 
you know, feeling yourself a little bit, you know, you're, you're kind of, you know, maybe you're walking a little more independently. But as we were walking down New York and walking down Broadway, and Ryland begins to see all the different people that are around there, and some interesting looking people, and frankly, some people that look a little bit intimidating, a little bit scary. I noticed that Ryland came up behind me and grabbed my hand. And it was like, oh, I missed that. It was a cool moment. It was a great moment. I felt like dad. You know, you feel, you feel fathers, mothers, you know this too. It's that protective instinct that you have and you're like, Yes, I'm his dad. I'm going to take care of him. And so I gripped and I held his hand tight. And we walked and we navigated through that place that looked scary to a nine-year-old. That's God. That's God when he extends your hand in the remotest part. In a place that might be, as you're going to get into, the darkest part. God sees and God knows and God's ex God extends his hand to you and holds it and not only just holds it, but then leads you. And I wonder when we sing songs like that, you know, we, we, he leadeth me. Do we really think that he does? Or is it sometimes more like, I wish we leadeth him. And we travel through this life thinking I'm leading and I'm just bringing God along. And then we wonder why we get so uncomfortable with when we are out of control of things. And I wonder if in those moments where we feel out of control, that it's actually been us leading ourselves and not letting God lead us. That when we find ourselves in those horrible places in the remotest part of the sea, as David says, even if I am the furthest away from anybody at all, God extends his hand and says, I'm going to lead you. Take my hand. Let me lead you through this. Because I alone know you and I alone know the circumstances in which you are. Why? Because I know everything and I know you and I am everywhere. So he goes on to this next part. In verse 11, he says, If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the light around me will be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as, as, bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. This, in verse 10 here, this idea of even your hand will lead me really kind of, kind of permeates that whole passage. That even, even if, if uh, I cannot flee from your presence, even if I'm in heaven, even if I'm in Sheol, even if I take the wings of dawn, even if I am in the depths of Sheol, even if I am in darkness, you are still there extending your hand to me. So that extends both before and after. And so the darkness that David might experience, God sees. Now again, this is where we can say, is this something that's good or is this something that is bad? If you're someone that wants God's presence in your life, then this is fantastic. That God sees, and now... Now, David, again, is using the extreme here. He's using physical darkness to explain something. But obviously, the, the, we can take this to mean something beyond just the physical. Have you ever found yourself in dark places? Where you feel like no one is seeing you. That no one knows exactly what you're going through. The one who knows you the best sees everything. The one who knows you inside and out is there with you. He transcends darkness just as he transcends time.
God transcends time. We see that in, in Peter. But he also transcends darkness. There's no hiding from God. Even in, 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 the, in, the, in the private sins that we might have, God sees those. I think sometimes we're like this little guy. Have you ever played hide and seek with this little guy? Not maybe specifically this guy, because this, this is just some random kid I found on the internet. But we've all played hide and seek with a toddler, right? Two, three, four years old, and we tell them to hide, and what do they think hiding is? Right? Because if I can't see you, you can't see me. And I wonder if that's how we often act with God. Because we don't see him physically, we think, you don't see me. And while we may not consciously carry that idea out in our mind and think that, our behavior and actions might suggest otherwise. And that we're not going through this life thinking, man, I am, so, I am so alone. There's no one here. And we forget about the most powerful entity that wants to be with us and next to us and lead us. We're not alone. The great designer of this universe wants to have a relationship with us and knows us better than anybody else in this world. And is here with us. So the lesson that we take from this here, I, I, want us, I want us to look here at a couple of verses now with this in mind. Okay? A couple of verses that we know, that we know very well, but with now with Psalm 139, with the backdrop of 7 through 12, I want us to see that with these verses that we know well. Romans 8, 37 through 39. But in all things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us, for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now take the backdrop of 7 through 12 of Psalm 139 and fill that into this verse that we know and we love. It's because God is with us. God knows us. He is in our presence. He is here with us right now. That's why we will never fail. God is with us. Another verse. Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. For us to truly understand the depth, the breadth, the length of his love, we need to understand his presence in our life. That's how much he loves us. He's here with you. So our, our lesson can be brought to this, this thought and this idea. It's not just that God is everywhere. He's everywhere with me. Amen. Let that sink in. Because if you're like me, I'm not always thinking about this on a daily basis, that God is with me. And I wonder how I would change if I thought about this all the time. I wonder how I would react to people. I wonder how, what, how my response would be to temptation. I wonder how my response would be to people that I come into contact with. I wonder how I would be driving on the roads. I wonder how I would be with my wife, with my children, with my friends, with my enemies. If I thought about this, this brought comfort to David. 
this psalm, as you read through it, he's going he's to come to a conclusion that we're going to get to as well, that I hope that we all get to also. And we'll get there in a couple of weeks. If you already know what it is, you can read the last part of the verse, you'll figure it out, but I'm not going to tell you what it is yet. But God knows us, and he's everywhere with us. We're going to look at that next passage there, starting in verse 13. So we've got two more lessons out of this psalm. No one knows us better than God. And no one, no one is with us more than God. Let's go to him all the time. For those two reasons alone. If you are struggling through life's difficulties, through things maybe you do feel alone, maybe you feel... <clears throat> withdrawn from. Maybe you need to be reminded that God is with you even when you are by yourself physically. Maybe you're struggling with a bunch of other things. This front row here on this side is available. This row has been taken. <laughs> but this is available. And, and what better to have a church family to gather around you pray and remind you of God's presence with your brothers and sisters in Christ. <coughs> if you are not yet a Christian, God wants to know you and God wants to be in your presence. And as we read in through the, the New Covenant portion of, of our Bible found in the New Testament, we find out that God's Spirit is given to us as a gift when we are immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. And that gift is given to us and dwells with us. God is with us. And if you are ready to do that this morning, we are ready to, to be able to help you to do that as well. If you have any reason to come forward, you can come. And together we stand and sing.